Hello, my name is Magnus Petersen. This talk is about the S&P 500 and adaptive rebalancing. The talk is based on this book and you can click on the image or the link below the video. During the period 1978 to 2013, the average annualized return was almost 6% for US government bonds with one year maturity. The bond returns are guaranteed by the government of the United States. Compare this to the average annualized return for the S&P 500, which was 11 to 13 percent depending on the investment duration between one and ten years. But the S&P 500 was also very volatile with a standard deviation over 17 percent for annual returns and the greatest annual gain was over 70 percent and the greatest annual loss was almost 50 percent. So we can rebalance between the S&P 500 and US government bonds to lower the volatility. So each year the portfolio is rebalanced back to the desired allocation. If the S&P 500 have gained, then we sell some of it and buy more bonds and vice versa. In fixed rebalancing, we use a predetermined allocation, for example, 50-50 or 25-75. So this would mean that we would have 25% invested in the S&P 500 and 75% invested in US government bonds. And then after a year, we rebalance so we have the same allocation. This is very simple to do, but it does not take the price level of the S&P 500 into account. There is a relation between the price to book ratio of the S&P 500 and its long-term returns. And there is another talk for more on this. And we can use this relation to adapt the rebalancing and the portfolio allocation. The stock weight is a part of the portfolio invested in the S&P 500. And it is calculated using the price to book ratio of the S&P 500 and one formula for the medium risk strategy is like this. So the stock weight is calculated as 1.5 minus 0.5 multiplied by the price to book ratio. And this is then limited between 0 and 1. Note that the stock weight is plotted for each day during this long period, but the rebalancing is done annually. For example, around year 1980, the price to book ratio was very low, so the stock weight was high, almost 1. So almost the entire portfolio should be invested in the S&P 500 in these years. And around year 2000, the price to book ratio was very high. So the stock weight was zero, which means the entire portfolio should be invested in government bonds. So let's look at a few examples on how to calculate the stock weight. On January 12, 1999, the price to book ratio was 4.64. So the stock weight is calculated using the formula on the previous slide. We have the formula here. We plug in the price to book ratio and calculate. The inner number here becomes minus 0.82. And the limit function limits between 0 and 1. And this is lower than 0, so the result is a 0. And this means that the entire portfolio should be invested in US government bonds. And the price to book ratio was high in several years. And then in 2003 it had decreased to 2.89 so we calculate the stock weight again we plug in the price to book ratio and we get a result of 0.06 so six percent should be invested in the S&P 500. Then in 2008 the price to book ratio was 2.52 and we calculate the stock weight and it is 0.24 so 24 percent of the portfolio should be invested in the S&P 500 and the remaining in US government bonds. So let's look at the last example again. We calculated that the stock weight should be 0.24 and this means 24% of the portfolio should be invested in the S&P 500 and the rest in government bonds. So from January 2008 to 2009, the S&P 500 lost about 38%. US government bonds yielded about 2.8% in that year. So the return on the rebalanced portfolio from January 2008 to 2009 is calculated as follows. We have the stock weight which is 0.24 and we have the multiplied by the stock return which was minus 38%. And then we have one minus stock weight multiplied by the bond return which was 2.8% and we get a result of approximately minus 7%. So that was the return on our rebalanced portfolio. The Full investment in the S&P 500 had lost 38%. The US government bonds gained 2.8%. And we, in our rebalanced portfolio, lost 7%.
So we did a lot better than the S&P 500, and we did quite a bit worse than the US government bonds. We can do a backtest using the medium risk adaptive rebalancing strategy on all possible starting dates and investment periods up to 10 years during 1978 to 2013. The box plot shows the statistics for the annualized return. So we have the years of investing down here going from 1 up to 10. And then we have the annualized return here. And we show the distribution of the returns here. So for an investment period of one year, we would have losses that were... The worst loss was almost minus 15%. And the best gain was more than 65%. The median was something like 5-6% maybe. And let's look at, say, a 10-year investment period. Then there were no losses. And the worst annualized return was maybe, I don't know, 2%. The best was maybe um, 18%. Um, and the median was maybe, I don't know, 5 or 6%. This can be a bit difficult to see in the box plot. The box plot is good to get a, an overview so we can see that the distributions become narrower as we invest for more years and, and the probability of loss becomes a lot lower. And after um, five or six years, uh, there were no losses. And if we want to see more details, we can look at the statistics in a table form instead. So here we have the years of investing. Here we have the minimum annualized return, the first quartile, the median, the mean or the average, and the third quartile and the maximum and the standard deviation. And the probabilities will be discussed in one of the following slides. So let's look at one year of investing. The minimum annualized return was minus 13.9%. The average was 9.3 and the maximum was 65.6%. You should note that the median is quite a bit lower than the mean. So let's compare the long-term performance of the medium risk adaptive rebalancing, which is the black line here. And we compare it to the S&P 500 and we have a reinvestment of dividends. And this gives us the red line here. And we have a, an investment in US government bonds and reinvestment each year in US government bonds. And then we get the blue line here. So we see that the rebalancing is somewhere between the US government bonds and the S&P 500. But this is not always the case. So let's look at an example where the rebalancing is better than the S&P 500. So again, we have the red line here is the S&P 500. The blue line is a government bond. And the black line is the rebalanced portfolio. So let's look at an example where the S&P 500 is a lot better than the rebalanced portfolio. And this example starts in 1990 and goes for 10 years. So we have the government bonds down here and the rebalanced portfolio was invested in the S&P 500 for some of the first years and a little in the following years. But after something like uh, 1997, six, it was entirely invested in US government bonds. So the result is after 10 years, it only did somewhat better than US government bonds. But this was a period of a tremendous bull market for the S&P 500. So the S&P 500 performed a lot better than our rebalanced portfolio. Now let's look at the probability of our rebalanced portfolio underperforming either bond only, which is an investment and reinvestment in US government bonds, or stock only, which is a pure investment in the S&P 500 and reinvestment of the dividends. So these probabilities are really historical frequencies. So we have Again, made a backtest uh, on all starting dates and um, investment periods up to 10 years in the period 1978 to 2013. And then we count how many of them have performed worse than the US government bonds or the S&P 500. We have the years of investing over here and we have the probability of loss. That is, the annualized return is less than zero. And for one year of investing, that probability was 0 0.06 or 6%. The probability of underperforming an investment in US government bonds was 18% for one year of investing. And this decreased until it was 3% for five years of investing. And, and it stayed at 3% for uh, up to 10 years of investing. 
The probability of underperforming the S&P 500 was quite high, and the lowest one was 60% for five years of investing, and the highest was 84%, which was for nine years of investing. I haven't shown a comparison to fixed rebalancing in these slides, so you will have to look in the book for the details. But the conclusion is that adaptive rebalancing has several advantages over fixed rebalancing for similar levels of mean annualized return. Adaptive rebalancing had much lower probability and magnitude of loss and significantly lower probability of underperforming the S&P 500 and US government bonds. And for detailed comparison, you will have to see the book. And the book also has several other adaptive strategies. You can click on the image or on the link below the video.